Welcome to the Town of Brookhaven Disability Task Force Virtual Inclusion Conference. Raising Awareness About Inclusion, featuring our keynote speaker, Winifred Schiff, along with presentations from partners of the task force to share information on healthcare, occupational therapy, inclusion in the community, farming, athletics, the arts, mental health, as well as an interactive discussion on what inclusion means to you. Good evening and welcome to the Town of Brookhaven's Disability Task Force Disability Inclusion Conference. My name is Clifford Hamowitz. My he, he, him pronoun, I'm wearing a gray shirt with a black and white tie and glasses. I am a head injury survivor and the uh, liaison to the Disability Task Force. Before we begin with our formal program, please join us as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Tommy. Good evening. My name is Marlene Patty. My pronouns are she, her. I am the chairwoman of the Disability Task Force. On September 30th, 2014, Supervisor Edward Romaine and the Town Board passed Resolution 214-672, establishing the Town of Brookhaven's Disability Task Force. Persons with disabilities and their families or caregivers face daily challenges. The mission of the Disability Task Force is to provide the Town Board with information and recommendations that will help the Town in its efforts to develop programs and ensure accessibility in facilities in order to accommodate and offer equal opportunities for residents with special needs and also allow them to be active members of our community. The theme of this conference is especially meaningful, raising awareness about inclusion as it represents that all people, regardless of their abilities, disabilities, or health care needs, have the right to be respected and appreciated as valuable members of their communities. I would like to take this time to thank the occupational therapy students, Nicole White, Kaylin Healy, and Joy Tianco, without whom this event would not be possible, and the graphic design student, Jessica Cruz, who created our logo for this event from Seth Community College. At this time, we'd like to share a special message from Supervisor Ed Romaine and the Town Brookhaven Town Board. I would like to personally thank the Supervisor for providing the task force the opportunity to bring our community together. Hi, I'm Brookhaven Town Supervisor Ed Romaine, and I'd like to welcome you to the Town's Disability Task Force Virtual Inclusion Conference. Persons with disability face daily challenges that they must overcome to be active members of our community. To them, inclusion means an opportunity for those who may feel left out of the mainstream, especially in education and in the workplace. Their families and caregivers also face challenges that seem to be insurmountable, but they're not. Thanks to the Americans with Disability Act of 1990, people with disabilities have the freedom equality, and the opportunity to participate fully in public life. Because our strengths lie in our diversity, the Town of Brookhaven's Disability Task Force helps to develop programs that offer equal opportunity for each resident with special needs. It allows them to become active members of our community and to do their part by making life better for everyone. I'd like to thank the Disability Task Force and the occupational therapy students from Stony Brook University for their hard work throughout the year for coordinating this very special event. Thank you for watching and enjoy the conference. I'm Brookhaven Town Council member Jonathan Kornreich and I'd like to welcome you to the 2021 Brookhaven Disability Task Force Inclusion Conference. Children and adults with special needs are just like everyone else. They want equal opportunity in all realms of life, such as at school and work. Everyone deserves independence and the opportunity to live a successful and rewarding life. 
As a longtime school board trustee, I've seen the transformative power of investing in our students with special needs, and I know what they can accomplish when empowered with the right tools and resources. I thank the town's Disability Task Force and all the volunteers for the work that you do to help people with special needs and their families. Thank you for joining us and for being part of this very important event. Thanks. Hi, I'm Councilwoman Jane Bonner. Welcome to the Town of Brookhaven Disability Task Force Virtual Inclusion Conference. Inclusion is an important issue that has an impact on many of our families, friends, and neighbors. Diane Rickler, past president of Inclusion International said, inclusion is about creating a better world for everyone. Following her lead, we know that it's not about making people fit into a system, it's about transforming the system to create a better world. Her words resonate loud and clear every day at home, at school, and on the job. We've come a long way, but there's still so much more to do. I thank the town's Disability Task Force for hosting tonight's virtual event and for the work that they do each day for the residents of the town of Brookhaven. Hi, I'm Councilman Kevin Laval. Thank you for joining us at the town of Brookhaven's Disability Task Force Virtual Inclusion Conference. Inclusion is a universal human right. It's about gaining social acceptance and being valued for who you are. No matter what age or disability, children and adults benefit from the high expectations, social interaction, and opportunities that inclusion has to offer. Our schools are working to make inclusion the rule rather than the exception. When a child's education is more inclusive, it follows through to their future employment, family life, and community engagement. To parents of children with special needs, I ask that you continue to advocate for your children's right to the best that our education system has to offer. If we improve life for people with disabilities, we improve life for everyone. Thank you and enjoy the program. Good evening, I am Councilman Neil Foley. The Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life, including jobs, schools, transportation, and more. This groundbreaking act, which was signed into law by President George H.W. Bush in 1990, changed the life of millions of Americans. 31 years have passed, but exclusion still creates obstacles that must be overcome by people with disabilities. The problem is a difficult one, but the solution is simple. Inclusion opens the door to a life filled with opportunity where anything is possible. In the words of Senator Tammy Duckworth, a combat veteran who lost both her legs in combat. The ADA is the living testament to our national commitment that we will always stand up for our neighbors' right to live fulfilling lives. Hi, I'm Councilman Michael Lugarcio. As a former school board president, I was an advocate for inclusion in the classroom and providing an equal education for every child. It was my job to ensure that teachers had the right training and the right tools to do their job. As the town council liaison to the Department of Housing and Community Development, I am an advocate for community inclusion and equal opportunity for everyone. I believe that people should be defined by what they can do, not by what they cannot do. Working with the Town of Brookhaven's Disability Task Force, I am determined to help residents with disabilities lead productive and meaningful lives so they can make a positive impact on our community. Thank you for sharing this special night. And remember, when we empower people with disabilities in school, at work, and in the community, we all win. It's the right thing to do. Hi, I'm Councilman Dan Panico, and I want to welcome you to the Town of Brookhaven's Disability Task Force Virtual Inclusion Conference. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines inclusion as the act or practice of including and accommodating people who have historically been excluded. It's a simple concept, but many children and adults are still excluded in the classroom, at work, and in society. The challenges that they face may be difficult to overcome, but not impossible, especially when we work together to make inclusion a part of everyday life. We need to make sure that people with disabilities have a voice and are encouraged to contribute their time and talent to making our world a better place to live. I thank the town's Disability Task Force for generating awareness on this important issue, and I thank you for participating in this very special event. 
I want to welcome everybody because this is another first for the Disability Task Force. It unfortunately due to the pandemic we could not do our virtual our in-person event. So welcome and enjoy this new experience with us on our first virtual conference. Great. Thank you, Cliff. And thank you, Councilman and Thank you, Supervisor Edward Romain and Town Councilman for your continued support. At this time, I would like to continue with our conference by addressing the agenda for the evening and acknowledging keynote speaker and panelists. This evening, we will hear from nine different organizations. Number one, the Interagency Council of Developmental Disabilities Agencies. Number two, Hobbs Farm. Number three, Top Soccer. Number four, Stony Brook School of Occupational Therapy, a huge contributor to planning this conference. Number five, Sunshine Prevention Center. Number six, Gigi's Playhouse of Long Island. Number seven, Destination Accessible. Number eight, Emix Elder Care. Number nine, Music Academy for Special Learners. Later in the program, you will be provided with the opportunity to have a Q&A dialogue session with the organizations of your choosing and participate in an open discussion about what inclusion means to you. We uh, would like to refer you to our agenda and virtual resources table at the website listed um, on our Town of Brookhaven. You will see that in our information post and chat box. Now I would like to um, introduce our keynote speaker, Winifred Schiff, Associate Executive Director of Legislative Affairs of the Interagency Council of Developmental Disabilities Agencies, Inc. Winnie has been the Associate Executive Director for Legislative Affairs at the Interagency Council of Developmental Disabilities Agency since 2008. In this role, she advocates at the state level regarding legislation and policies that affect people with developmental disabilities and their families and the service providers which support them collaborating with other associations in the developmental disabilities field and beyond, Winnie has been instrumental in spotlighting issues to achieve results. Prior to that, she worked as Director of Marketing and Special Projects at AHRC NYC for 21 years and was instrumental in developing the largest supported employer program for people with developmental disabilities in New York City. Among her accomplishments are the creation of a staff development program focusing on customer service and relationship development and a successful skills training and job placement program for inner city youth with and without disabilities. She has more than 30 years experience in various developmental disability services, including direct support, program design, staff training and administration. Winnie wants to see a world where all people are valued for their unique contributions and receive the assistance they need to participate fully in their communities. Winnie, the floor is yours. So, you know, my name, Winnie Schiff, and my pronouns are she, her. And um, before I flip to the background for the conference, which I love because um, when we all, you know, in these virtual kind of things, when we all share a background, it unites us, which is really, really important in our work. Um, but so, first of all, there are guitars and other instruments hung on the back wall behind me. And, you know, during COVID, um, all the offices were closed and I had to start working at home. So the room where my husband used to play the guitar is now my office. And the poor guy, because we're in a small apartment, is um, playing his guitar in the building hallway outside our apartment now. But um, we're making it work, as I know all of you are, too. Um, it has not been an easy time for any of us. So um, first of all, I'm going to pick my background. And while I'm doing that, I want to tell you that I have curly blonde hair and I'm wearing a black um, top that's sleeveless. And when you have curly hair, these backgrounds look really strange. It, it ends up being like you have some kind of a weird helmet on. So there's my weird helmet. My hair will go in and out of it, but I still love the background, so it's not a problem to me. Um, 
So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey and um, take you through a little bit of history and get through the events that led up to where we are right now and then talk about where we can take it for the future together. So um, back in the day um, when I was in college, I didn't know what I wanted to do um, with, for my life's work. And for anybody who, a young person who doesn't know yet or anybody who's still trying to figure out what your um, life's work is going to be, sometimes things, the best things happen um, accidentally. So I started out as pre-med, but I didn't want to go to school that long. And then I switched to psychology, but I realized I'd still have to go to school for a long time in order to get a job. So I switched to marketing and business and um, I got a degree and I did something else for a little while, but um, I came back to AHRC in New York City where I worked in a part-time job while I was in college. And I worked at a group residence for 12 people. And um, at that time, minimum wage had just gone up to $3.35 an hour. So now you know how old I am. Um, but my point in saying that is that my job paid like $8 an hour. I was a direct support professional at a group residence for 12 people that was near my school and it was my part-time job. It was a great job for me. And um, so that was $4.65 over the minimum wage at that time um, and more than twice the minimum wage at that time. So today, if our DSPs were making $4.65 over minimum wage, they'd be making $19.65 an hour. And imagine if their salaries, which they deserve, were doubled, they would be making $30 an hour with a minimum wage of 15. So we're gonna come back to that in a little while. So I had no experience. I didn't know what I was getting into and I absolutely fell in love with my job. The people who lived at the residence were my second family. They came home with me and had barbecues on the weekends at my parents' house. And um, I stayed there for a very long time until, like I said, I got a job in marketing and business, which I had trained for. And quickly I realized that wasn't for me. And I went back to um, AHRC New York City where I worked for 21 years um, as, and as was previously just um, reported, I, I worked in employment programs there. So lots of people who lived at the residence where I worked had lived in Willowbrook. And Willowbrook was an institution on Staten Island. Um, some of us who are a little bit older know what it was, or if you've seen the movie or read any of the literature. Um, back in the day, doctors told parents who had babies with developmental disabilities to bring them to Willowbrook and leave them and go home and try again to have another baby. I mean, that is unbelievable to us right now. Um, that facility was meant for 4,000 people at the height of um, its you know, bursting at the seams, 6,200 people lived in Willowbrook. They, they were underfunded, obviously, understaffed. And when Robert F. Kennedy went in to look at it, he called it a snake pit. And it wasn't for many, many years that something was actually done about it. Um, what ended up happening is that Willowbrook is now ground zero for the civil rights movement for people with IDD. And um, the beginning of the closure of Willowbrook really began the deinstitutionalization in New York State. So now I'm gonna run through a couple of events, you know, in history um, quickly, um, just to give you kind of a, a, a real good backdrop on where we are right now. So in 1972, a class action lawsuit was brought against New York State by the parents of the 5,000 people who lived at Willowbrook. In 1975, the Willowbrook consent decree um, was finalized guaranteeing community residential opportunities and protections for people who had formerly lived at Willowbrook called the Willowbrook class, class action suit. In 1985, supported employment became a service that OPWDD funded. In 1986, the self-advocates um, formed SANIs, the Self-Advocacy Association of New York State. In 1990, like you previously heard, the Americans with Disabilities Act passed. Um, and all these things are a little gains, but you know, they're little, even though, even though they're huge, there wasn't that, that, that much change, but it's cumulative right over time. And it's all of us who are making these things happen. Um, in 1993, OPWDD started talking about person-centered planning. Also in 1993, a home and community-based service um, 
services were funded through the Medicaid waiver. So at that time, lots and lots of services under OPWDD, then OMRDD, um, became Medicaid services, which meant that we got a federal match for the New York state dollars. So we were really able to provide more and more services and supports for people in the community, which was a really good thing. That was a, a period of tremendous growth in the IDD field. Um, in 1998, New York State CARES started. We had a waiting list. When I worked at AHRC, I remember um, telling families that basically, as soon as you have a child who you think you will one day want to live in a residence, you need to put them on the waiting list because it's gonna take 15, 20 years for them to get a residence, if they ever will. Um, it was really, really bad. So New York State CARES, was um, called Creating Alternatives in Residential Environments, CARES, and they had a five-year plan to virtually eliminate the waiting list, and it was a really, really amazing thing. The waiting list was virtually eliminated. Not so now. We'll get there in a minute. Um, so it's all about money, right? We had um, all this money coming in from the federal government for Medicaid. And um, I won't get into the details of it, but there was a funding methodology that allowed New York State to build the feds for the institutional rate. So if everybody once lived in an institution before we had community residences, that was very expensive and we got all this money from the feds. Um, as people started to move out into the community, we still build that rate for those people. So we were able to do all these kinds of great services. Some were a little less expensive, so we could really do a lot of great things with the same money that we were getting. Um, I don't even remember what year it was, but it was in the early 2000s, maybe mid to two, mid 2000s, when um, the federal government said, wait a minute, we're paying you for people who live in institutions and they really live in the community. You know, this isn't right. The costs aren't the same. This doesn't make any sense. So they changed our funding methodology. We stopped bringing in all this money to the state and now we were more of an expense. So previous to that, there had been um, cost of living increases or they were called Medicaid trends, which was a percentage increase on the, on the total amount that New York State got to fund services. Um, and it would go up every single year because when we got that increase, it brought in tons of other money to New York State that they could do other things with. Other things in, um, for OMH, the Office of Mental Health, for um, the Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services. Um, the money was a little bit spread around, but it was all brought in because of this institutional rate that we were getting. So when they changed that funding methodology, 2008 was the last time we got an increase. So 2008 was the last time that the money that we were receiving was keeping up with the increase in our expenses and our ability to pay staff. We got, no, uh, no excuse me, that was 2010, not 2008. Um, so 2010 was our last trend. So we got no increases in 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. Actually, we got no increase until this year. This year is the first year that we got a 1% cost of living adjustment. It's only 1%, but it's based on the consumer price index, which is you know, the amount that all other expenses go up. So um, we feel that it was a victory because it's a, the restarting of, of the recognition that we need increases for a lot of different things. Now, I'm gonna go get away from those colas for a minute because we did get some targeted increases for specific things but it wasn't on our overall expenses so that if rent went up, utilities went up, gas went up, you know, whatever, you, we all know all expenses go up. We got no money for those things. We did get a little money for staff salaries, but I'll get back into that in one second. So um, the other thing that happened was there was a recession in 2008 and we had some cuts at that time. So we actually had less money coming in to serve more and more people. Um, now, New York State still, still provides more services than any other state to people and their families with IDD, but um, we are absolutely providing more services with less money than we did back in the day, and it shows. It shows so much that right now our staff salaries are minimum wage. 
Um, what happened is minimum wage was raised to $15 across the state, right? It was gradual. And um, on Long Island, it took a little bit longer than in New York City, but um, we're at $15. And we are just not able to pay much more than $15 to direct support professionals that do amazing work. And I know that because I was a DSP. Um, so staff salary stagnated. We just didn't give people raises. And um, the job became harder and harder. We had uh, all kinds of regulations that we never had and all kinds of paperwork requirements that we never had. And I'm not saying that any of those things are bad, but if we're expecting staff to do all of these things in addition to providing good support to people in the community, we really need to pay them money if we're going to get people who can do a good job at that. So um, we're in trouble right now. <laughs> um, Legislatively, we came up with a campaign called Be Fair to Direct Care. So this was a campaign. Um, it doesn't exactly translate because they're direct support professionals, but Be Fair to Direct Care is a catchy slogan, so we had to compromise on the name. Um, and this was to gradually raise DSPs to a living wage. And at the time, it was a few years ago, um, 2015, um, we had calculated the the living wage, kind of an average living wage across the state at being um, about $17 an hour. So, and of course this was um, right after the minimum wage started to go up. So nobody was at 15 yet. And we um, devised uh, a stepped up, um, just, just like minimum wage was gra a gradual increase to bring us up to 15, we had a gradual increase to bring us up to um, $17 and change. And we were successful. We all got together. We had um, families and providers and people with disabilities all getting together. We flooded the Capitol. We um, wrote letters. We had um, protests and rallies everywhere. Um, Long Island, New York City, upstate, Western New York, Capitol region. We were on the steps of the Capitol. Um, and Governor Cuomo came out and, um, at a, at a big rally that we had right in the Capitol. It's called the War Room. It's this big, beautiful room where they have um, paintings of all the different wars. And he picked up his hand and he said, I will not sign a budget that doesn't have raises for direct support professionals in it. So we were just ecstatic and we thought this was a wonderful thing. That initiative gave us one, two, three, four years worth of DSP salary increases and it wasn't enough. We're still way behind where we should be in, in people's salaries. So we came up with um, another campaign and this was just gonna be before COVID. Um, what, we, what we realized was that the financial position of agencies was so weak that even if we got a better salary for DSPs, if we couldn't get other money, to shore up the financial position of agencies, they were gonna go out of business and they wouldn't even be able to employ anybody. And then everybody would be back to state-run services. I'm not saying anything about whether they're good or bad, but the not-for-profit providers provide, you know, 85% of all the services to people. And we believe that's a good thing. And in order to keep them in business, we needed to do something like a COLA. So we were looking for a 3% increase every year for five years. And we were partnering with other organizations. We were with the OMH people and the OSS people, which are you know, the other state agencies, OMH's mental health. Um, and we were waging this great campaign and then COVID hit. So of course, you know, just like all of us on this call, every, everything ground to a halt. And um, before I get into what happened during COVID, I wanna just say that Across the board, our services have been neglected really always. Like in the beginning, they fund things pretty well. And then as time goes on, there's no increases. And all of a sudden it's um, impossible to, to hire staff. So that's early intervention for babies and toddlers, totally underfunded. Special ed preschools and schools, completely underfunded. Residential programs, day programs, employment, everything we do, there's not enough money anymore to support all the people who need support. So. 
COVID-19 really hit us hard. And for any of you who um, know people or who might live in a group living situation, you know, that was the most dangerous thing for COVID-19. So um, in the nursing homes, you know, what happened? There was a big scandal there and Governor Cuomo actually got in a little bit of trouble for the way he handled that. Um, we had a similar situation because it was group living and we all know that COVID spreads really, really fast among people who live together. Um, and we didn't have enough PPEs and day programs closed and everybody was stuck at home and staff were sick and people who lived with us were sick and, um, and we lost a lot of people. Um, but we got through it because we pulled together and the associations worked together to make sure that staff had um, PPE. You know what, I apologize because I use these acronyms and um, I was gonna start by saying, stop me if I do that. <laughs> um, but that's personal protective equipment and it's really just masks and gloves and gowns and face shields, things to protect you and the people that you work with from getting sick. And um, we, we just, we, we really worked hard to make sure that our staff had enough. Um, it, it was a terrible, terrible situation. And what ended up happening was schools were closed. So staff who had children couldn't work anymore because they had to be home with their kids. And some of them were afraid because the situations were you know, really dangerous. The virus was spreading. So now we, have, we had a bad staffing problem. In fact, we had a staffing emergency. Now we have a staffing super emergency. We just did a survey and there's um, across the state and it's worse in some places than others, there's um, an average 25% vacancy rate. So if you need, if you have five DSPs working in your program supporting people, you have one position vacant. So there's four people instead supporting all the people in your program. And this can lead to every terrible outcome you can imagine. It's an emergency. Um, Luckily, the federal government stepped up and thanks to Senator Schumer, um, New York State got a lot of money um, to help us get through this, this COVID-19 crisis. So our programs weren't cut because of obviously the economy really suffered. Um, I'm sure that um, you guys have been talking about it in Brookhaven because local governments were also really, really hurt but the federal government stepped up. We got state funding, we got local government funding, we got all kinds of other funding for education, for health and for other programs. And um, we're okay for the moment, but we're still in a position where our state agency, the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities is clearly choosing safety over choice and, inclus and inclusivity for people. And um, what, we, what we really need to do is get together and make sure that we advocate together. Get into that in one second. I wanna say that um, as far as employment goes, in 2013, the governor signed an executive order declaring New York State an employment first state, which should mean that we're really focused on people with disabilities working in jobs, but very little happened since 2013. But what we were able to do this year, and I'm really, really excited about it, is we passed a resolution in each house, the Assembly and the, and the New York State Senate, honoring essential workers with disabilities in New York State. And it's being tied to NADIEM, which is the National Disability Employment Awareness Month, and that's October. So um, I'll be sharing with you guys information on um, advocacy campaigns, and there should be a, an Assembly Roundtable coming up um, talking about how to increase um, employment of, people, of all people with disabilities in New York State. Um, so I'll be happy to get you that information. So this is what's been happening in, and um, the last thing that I wanna say about all of kind of what has brought us to this moment is that um, we are really organizing family groups and self-advocate groups and provider groups and um, all kinds of advocacy is happening right now. And we're really looking at increasing civil and human rights and, and focusing on ending discrimination and bias. And you know, I can run through all of the things that have been happening in the world with Black Lives Matter and raise the age so that people who are 16 are not put in jail with um, adults. Um, 
and the anti-Asian um, hate crimes and all of the advocacy that's going on there and anti-Semitic hate crimes and um, LGBTQ and gender identity awareness. Um, it's all really good. We're at this kind of a moment where everybody's coming together and everybody is advocating in their separate ways and we definitely have to do it together. There are ways for us to find places that work for all of us and, and we have to do more and more of supporting each other in advocacy. So I wanna end with talking about where we wanna go next. So the first thing is that we need data. Uh, New York State is, or at least my corner of New York State is notoriously terrible for collecting data. We ask them all the time. We think they have more than they're willing to share, but we know that they don't have what they need in order to make good decisions. We're right now about to embark on um, it's called the 507 planning process, and it's a legislative requirement for state agencies to come up with a five-year plan so that they can um, imagine where we wanna be in five years and make good decisions today for us to get to that spot that we designate. Um, it has been more ceremonial than not over um, my history in providing services, but this year we're really working um, as a, a, a unified, giant group of advocates to try to make it meaningful. We need data. If we don't know who is going to need services, where and what kind and when, then we're not going to be able to know how much money we're going to have to, to put aside in order to support people. And of course, we have to look for efficiencies. Everyone always has to do that. But, every, but, but if, we, if we keep saying we have this much money and we've got it do whatever we need to do with this much money, like, sorry guys, then let's get real, get the data and, and be honest about who we're going to decide to shortchange. And, and that is, that's, if you won't increase the money, then that's the decision you have to make and let's say it out loud. So that's part of the planning that we're doing right now. We have to make sure that direct support professionals are treated as the professionals that they are, that we have career paths, that their salaries reflect the amazing work that they do, and all of the other things that we need to put in place to make sure that we have a viable workforce for the future. And, and obviously for right now, we're in a terrible crisis this minute. So grassroots advocacy, I can't tell you how important that is. I know that we ask people to write letters or make phone calls and it feels like, oh, you know, what's my one letter or phone call gonna do? But you know something, it is so powerful. And it's not just you, it's you belonging to a group of people and everybody sending that letter or everybody making that call, you all showing up outside of your legislator's office with signs that are always polite, but absolutely targeted at what you need. And if we don't tell them what we need, they can't know it. They have, to, they have to know so many things. When I first took this job in 2008, I thought legislators would know all about developmental disabilities and the ins and outs of the way we're funded and what we needed to do. And I quickly learned that maybe one or two of them had a pretty good idea. And that was as good as it got. Everything else was gonna have to be me letting them know, this is what's wrong and why, and this is what we need and why and how. Um, and, and then there are partners in it. We have, I, I heard, you know, all of the little videos that your legislators did before um, this, before I got started here today, and, and they're all really supportive, it's clear, but they need our help so that we identify for them what we need for them to do. Um, so join groups, stay informed, show up, and, um, your relationships with your legislators are really everything. So don't be afraid, they're people, they wanna help and um, they need to hear from you. Thank you, Winnie. That was a great way to kick off this conference. So hi everyone, my name's Nicole. I'm a second year student uh, at the Stony Brook Occupational Therapy Program. My pronouns are she, her. I'm wearing a black shirt got a window and a tan curtain in my background. And we're all here to discuss that same theme of inclusion. And we have a great lineup of panelists who we're gonna get started with, whose missions are all alike and they've taken that word inclusion and just interpreted it in their own way. And their organizations have created really 
incredible opportunities in the community that you're all going to get to hear about and just expand those opportunities in all aspects of life for individuals of all different abilities. So at this time, I will introduce Ann Pellegrino from Hobbs Farms, who will be our first panelist. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Ann Pellegrino. I go by she, her, never ma'am, because that just makes me feel too old. I am wearing a black and white flannel shirt over a black t-shirt. Um, a lot of what Winifred said hit home to me. Um, when my son was 19, he was uh, um, in a car accident, which left him paralyzed from the neck down and on a ventilator. Um, he was a part of the Medicaid waiver program and um, it did wonders for him. Uh, he did go continue to go on to college and um, become a public speaker. However, I, I am president and founder of the Bethel Hobbs Community Farm. Um, we always wanted to make the farm an all inclusive for people in wheelchairs and things like that. However, I didn't know or realize until after my son's accident how hard and life can be and how many places people in wheelchairs cannot go. Um, so it became a life mission to, all right, we really need to stop and, and get this done. And through the Christopher Reeve Foundation and along with Eva Rodriguez from the OT program at Stony Brook, we um, got a grant and we were able to, um, to start up the wheelchair garden. Um, we just feel like it's um, very important for the farm to be inclusive to um, people with all abilities. And with that, we will go to the video so you can see what great things we're doing at the farm. Hi, this is Brookhaven Town Councilman Kevin Laval, and I'm joined today with uh, Ann Pellegrino here at Historic Hobbs Farm. I can tell you this is one of the jewels in the town of Brookhaven. This is a not-for-profit farm that's all volunteer, uh, that does so much for the community. So many people come together here. Just last year, over 50,000 pounds raised and given to charitable organizations during the pandemic. It's an amazing place. But what we're here to talk about today is what Hobbs is known for, going above and beyond for people with different abilities. I can tell you now, it's amazing to be here and having Ann with me, and she runs Hobbs Farm, Anne's going to talk to you a little bit about what do we do here, what's going on, how is it developed, how did this relationship start uh, with working with people with different abilities? Well, from day one, it was always our vision to have a place for people of all abilities to come. And um, a few years back, we got a grant from the Christopher Reeve Foundation, which helped us um, build this wheelchair garden. And w the reason for it is there's so many people with different abilities, uh, some in wheelchairs, some can't bend over, some are uneven with their walking. So we built these basically hip high so people that can't bend over can can now work and people that are in wheelchairs, it's high enough where they're not gonna tip over and fall in off the, out of their wheelchairs. So um, we try to make it an all-inclusive place where anybody can come. You know, one of the great things that we've seen here is we just have our great disability task force here in the town of Brookhaven. And we just got together and really came together recently. They have started to come down here over yes. weeks put a great relationship together. How has that been working out here at the farm? That has been working out amazing. Cliff is wonderful. He's he's a great guy to work with. He's full of resources. And um, we're even starting to work on a sensory garden um, later in the future um, where, you know, other people can come in and just enjoy that vision as well. Well, you know, it's always been great working with you, Ann. This is what Hobbs Farm is all about, bringing people together. No matter who you are, what your abilities are, this is why this place is so special to this community. Uh, I could also tell you, just for the viewers that are out there, to help raise money for this great farm to keep it running, on August 14th, we'll be running our Hobbs Farm Run the Farm 4 Mile Challenge coming up again this summer. We will be doing it live again, and we're very excited about it. Uh, so this is a huge thing. If you could come out and help out or run in the race, it would be a huge help. It helps raise money for this farm. And thank you once again for all you do here at Hobbs Farm. And we hope that everybody comes down that's watching this video to Center H and comes and participates in what, what goes on here. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Um, so that was Hobbs Farm, and we're going to move right along over to Tara Faf from Top Soccer. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on tonight to represent Top Soccer. I'm very excited because this is our first season in Middle Country Soccer Club. Um, we are an eight week program. We have one more Saturday left and it's been a great experience for the athletes and for everyone that's been involved. Um, it is a national program that is run through US Youth Soccer. And Middle Country has always had this vision of having this opportunity within their community. And they reached out to my husband, Dave Baff, who is a soccer expert. And I am a physical therapist that works with special needs children. So we all joined forces together and we developed a program for um, ages five and up for people of any mental or physical disability that have always wanted to play soccer. And when I field set up with various stations where they're learning soccer skills in a fun way. Every athlete that comes down is partnered with a buddy. Our, most of our buddies from this season were local soccer players from the middle country community and they got paired up. They work one-on-one. -on -one. We do bring them all together in a group for games like soccer tag, um, dribbling around the field, and we are, like I said, we have one more week for this season. We are planning on having a summer program, possibly a camp where it would be one full week. And then again, starting up in the fall. Um, I have a great video that was put together by our videographer. So if you'd like to play that. Favorite thing to do was to shoot on the ball. So I'll set up some phones over there. And based on your top soccer player size, strength, uh, you determine how far away you want them to shoot. If you get them really close, give them a point system. Make them really excited. Tell them there's 1,000 points in the score. Then yeah. you create 250 million points if you hit the bottom. Yeah, they get excited. I, I know if I tell my kids, they get 5,000 points or something. They're so excited. Um, over here, it's going to be clean the yard. This will be the first step.
So you can tell by that video that we had a lot of fun this season. Um, all the athletes, the buddies, everybody smiles the whole time. Our main goal is just to keep them on the field, having fun and opening soccer up to everybody, regardless of age and ability. Um, you can see in the video the age range that we had, but we also had varying physical disabilities. Um, we had two people that were in wheelchairs and they buddied up and they were able to kick the ball and join in on the fun as well. So it's truly open to everybody. And that's for our buddies too. Um, this year we had opened it up to players within the soccer club, but we also had some people from the community come down and help out too. Again, you don't need to have soccer experience, just be open to having fun and keeping the kids on the field and engaged. Um, thankfully to Middle Country Soccer and to a partnership with Draper Assets, we were able to provide this season free of charge to all of our participants and we're hoping to keep that going every season. Um, every athlete gets soccer jerseys from Middle Country. They get a blue and a white, so a home jersey and an away jersey, and they also get a ball. So it's like they're truly part of a soccer experience. Um, you can see in the video too, there was some face painting and a barbecue station, which we had a festival day uh, about two weeks ago. And we just opened it up to be a good time for the families to come down, play some soccer. There was cotton candy and popcorn too, <laughs> and just a lot of fun. So we are opening registration for the fall season sometime in June. The dates usually run parallel to their intramural dates as well, which is usually September, eight weeks into October. And then, like I mentioned before, we'll have the summer camp, which are dates to be determined as well, too. So definitely go to the Middle Country Soccer website and check it out. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Yeah, that video really showcased just how inclusive it is. I love top soccer. Um, they do a great job. So um, we're going to move on to the third panelist. It's going to be from the Stony Brook OT program. We're going to have our recent grads, Derek Wagner and Trizan DeRose, present on OT. Hi, everybody. Just waiting for the PowerPoint to go up. But Hello. we can do that's can there. Me okay. Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Derek. Nicole, do you have our presentation up? I don't see it. Uh, does the town have their you presentation able, ready? You should be able to screen share. Oh, so we're just going to screen share? Okay. Yes. 
Okay. Give me a second. Um, hold on. Oops, it's not working. All right. We got it. Derek, would you like to start? Yes. Hello, my name is Derek. I use he, him, his, and they, them, theirs pronouns. I'm an occupational therapy student, graduated, but also finishing clinicals. Um, I'm wearing a short sleeve button up shirt with like a dark blue pattern and I have black and white striped curtains behind me. I am Trizan Diaros. I am also an occupational therapy student, graduate, also in clinicals. Um, I use she and her pronouns. I am wearing a cardigan that's striped white and blue. And I have my room in the background with a little art. Um, and today we're gonna be presenting on occupational therapy's role in the community. Um, so our opening slide, the title is Occupational Therapy in the Community, and then there's two boxes with each of our names and our pronouns and titles, and there's two images. One is an older woman using adaptive equipment to pour a drink out of a pitcher, and the other one is a young child sitting in an adapted swing. Next slide. Okay, so our next slide has three separate boxes in it, and the first one has a big question mark and says, what is occupational therapy? So... Um, first, we're going to talk about in our presentation what occupational therapy is. The second box has an image of two people talking with word bubbles uh, and captioned OT in the role of community. So next in our presentation, we're going to talk about the different roles that occupational therapy can take within um, the communities. And the third box has three horizontal lines with three circles on the lines going ho horizontally top to bottom, uh, left to right and it's captioned the three tiers of intervention. So finally in our presentation, we will be discussing the three different tiers of intervention that occupational therapy can take. Next slide. Okay, so on this slide, you can see a picture of six hands holding, um, forming a ring, and the text says occupational therapy, colon, what we do. OTs treat the practical difficulties of daily life created by physical, mental, emotional, and or social factors. How we do it is identify, identifying barriers, remediating or modifying tasks and or your environment. And why we do it is to increase independence, preserve dignity, and improve quality of life across the lifespan. So I wanted to open up a small discussion of Anyone who's ever heard of occupational therapy, if you've ever received occupational therapy, in what context have you received occupational therapy? And what do you think we do? Because this is a very common question that everybody never really knows the answer to. So does anyone have any experience with occupational therapy? I see Tara raised her hand. Who's <laughs> I love OTs. <laughs> I work side by side with them every day and they're amazing. I want to share that um, when I acquired my head injury and I was at St. Charles and they told me I was going to occupational therapy, I thought that I was going to be getting, putting me back to work. And so it wasn't until I realized that what they did was they took a person who wasn't walking, who was barely talking, and really was a shell of himself. And through occupational therapy, working with an occupational therapist, I learned how to walk again, how to feed myself again. And really, if it wasn't for occupational therapy, I don't think that I would be where I am here today. And, and I think that's why I have such a, uh, such a keen uh, kinship with Stony Brook occupational therapy students, because I know how valuable it could be. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I also see um, Patty says that her daughter receives OT, 
Andrea says, both her children receive OT in school, helping hold a pencil, sit comfortably in a chair in school. And Lisa also says that her children receives OT. Thank you for sharing. So yes, um, like uh, I did not see your name. Whoever was just speaking, I'm so sorry. It didn't come up. Um, but the person who was just speaking, um, talking about receiving occupational therapy, right? So someone who is um, older and also as we see in the chat, they, they're talking about their children also receiving OT. So OTs really work with the spectrum, right? From birth to, to elderly. Um, and the main goal is really client-based. So how do we get you to do the things that you want to do, right? And increase your independence in the way that you see your independence to be. Thank you for sharing to all those who um, did. Um, now we're going to go to the next slide. So this slide is titled OT in the community. Number one, advocacy. A, identify a need, develop a solution. B, work with local and federal government. So I'm gonna expand on that first before I uh, dive into describing the next part of the slide. Um, one of the major roles that OTs can take in a community is being an advocate. As a practitioner, OTs can identify health issues that might not be covered by insurances and also to help develop programs to assess those concerns. In these instances, occupational therapists often work with underserved populations and promote more intentional inclusion of all peoples within the communities. They can work at the level of local government and federal government to help enact change and to be involved with things such as grant writing and policy change to develop and reach goals. So number two on the slide says consultation, A, businesses, advocacy groups, government agencies, retail groups, et cetera. So I'm gonna expand on that more. Sometimes community OTs can take on a role of a consultant for groups and organizations. Some examples of those are businesses, healthcare organizations, advocacy groups, neighborhood alliances, local media, government agencies, retail groups, and much, much, much more. So there's not really a limit as to what, what kind of groups we can consult. Through consultation, these groups can learn how to best include and serve diverse populations and the communities that they're working with. Number three on the slide, it says education. A, health and wellness promotion, community support. So next, OTs can take on the role of educators. This is a core part of every aspect of being an occupational therapist, but we wanted to highlight it here because sometimes this can be the main focus of a community-based OT. They can be focused on uh, promotion of health and wellness of the community at large, and it can also be more targeted to more specific populations as we're gonna talk about a little bit more on the slide. And on, uh, on the side is depicted a picture of two people. One of them is sitting at a table, gardening, moving um, a small plant into a tray in front of them. And the person behind them is holding a small shovel wearing an apron. Next slide. Okay, so just to provide more specific examples on the type of intervention that occupational therapy can play a role specifically in the community. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about the three tiers of the intervention of OTs. So in this slide, it's titled the three tiers. It has six boxes with text, three with text, three with images. The three images are triangles with three tiers each, and the three boxes with text read the following. So the first box um, reads primary, semicolon, universal, and this is basically um, health promoting occupations for prevention, which focus and the focus of service are educational and legislative. So an example is that occupational therapy takes part in backpack awareness days in schools. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever heard of backpack awareness days. So these, these days are dedicated towards the beginning of the school year and it's for everybody, right? So of all abilities, whether a child has a disability or not, and um, through this program, we're able to educate children on proper ergonomics, um, proper body mechanics to, to promote back health and prevent back injury. Um, so that is one way that we provide universal intervention um, through um, health education to the public. In terms of the second box, that reads secondary, 
semicolon at risk. This basically means early identification for prevention, promotion, and restoration. So the focus of service is consultation and modification. When we talk about a secondary tier of service, it's more um, directed towards at-risk populations. So for example, right now in my clinicals, I am at a domestic violence shelter for people, specifically for people with disabilities. And so in this way, we're able to modify their environment. And we're also able to do consultations on different services that they want to access in their community. And lastly, on the last box, the tertiary says tertiary semicolon identified reads specific interventions for maximized quality of life. And this is probably the one that you're all most familiar with, with everybody who shared today too. So the focus of service in this, in this tier is direct individual or sometimes groups. Um, like our previous participant who mentioned earlier that he received rehabilitation at a clinic after an incident, right? And regaining kind of regaining function. This is a form of tertiary specific identified intervention. So we can work as consultants for different organizations to make them more accessible to other communities. Um, but we can also work individually with other people with their goals and their physical, emotional, and social function. So now that we have talked a little bit about more of what OTs can do, I wanted to pose the question, how do you think OT can be applied to your respective communities? And in what ways do you think you would like to utilize OT in the community? Any thoughts? That's okay, it takes time. <laughs> but um, I hope that this was helpful and I hope for the community groups that are here, um, you find this helpful and hopefully you can utilize occupational therapy for your programs as well. Um, for the next slide, we just have a picture of um, a picture of a girl with hands over her eyes with one um, prosthetic arm and then one of her um, regular arms. And uh, we're saying thank you for questions, requests, and anything else that we can help you with. You can email us, reach out to us. I see in the chat that there are a bunch of people. Okay, Derek typed it in the chat too. So if anyone wants to copy the email that we have, if you have any questions about the type of services that we can offer to either community programs or individuals, um, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you so much um, for listening <laughs> and participating. Derek, any last words? No, nope, thank you so much, Jazan and Nicole for doing all this yeah, and everybody thanks, for being Nicole. here and presenting and whatnot. Yeah. Thanks to the task force too. <laughs> Thank you both for giving that little insight on OT. Um, I do want to remind everyone that there is a virtual resource table with a lot of resources from the presenters tonight, um, as well as any of the partners um, who partnered with us tonight with the task force. Um, you're very encouraged to check out that table. There's a lot of great documents and the link is in the chat box. And if it got pushed up, then we'll repost it. So it uh, floats down to the bottom again. Um, so next up, I want to introduce our fourth panelist, Carol Carter from the Sun Sunshine Prevention Center. Okay. Hello, my name is Carol Carter. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. I'm wearing actually a pink and green floral spring vest. I have brown short hair, brown eyes. I'm actually wearing glasses, helps me see my uh, reading a little bit. Uh, my background is a beautiful country cottage with purple, white, and red flowers. So um, I am co-founder and CEO of Sunshine Prevention Center. Um, I'm really happy to be here and really have the opportunity to share our service with, services with you. I really want to thank um, Cliff and I want to thank Nicole for their support and with this conference directions on, on doing this and even in helping me plan for the presentation. 
Um, my mission and the mission of Sunshine is to work together with the community and to be able to pro provide the best services for children and families. During the pandemic, many of us experienced the sadness or the pain associated with isolation and separation. Now more than ever, we all know the importance of inclusion, feeling a part of or belonging somewhere like school, workplace, or even a social group. The New York State Task Force on Quality Inclusive Schooling states that successful inclusive, inclusive education happens primarily through accepting, understanding, and attending to differences, including physical, cognitive, academic, social, and emotional. Inclusion values diversity and uniqueness where every child feels safe and shares a sense of belonging, where everyone has the opportunity to contribute to and influence each other regardless, regardless of any challenges they may be facing. Sunshine's educational support model, utilizing successful evidence-based curricula to design our programs that aim to create a sense of belonging, self-esteem, and build positive social skills. Sunshine's alternative education program targets high school students who have had difficulty in the traditional school, school setting due to various behaviors. The program meets the students' individual academic and developmental levels, helping them succeed academically and social emotionally. Our age appropriate support groups and our up, upcoming summer prevention programs benefit all children. We believe that all children, all people can learn from and teach each other. They learn acceptance of others and that each person is unique. All children are provided equal opportunities to participate in the same type of program and activity. The small group settings, the positive role models and mentors and the prevention focused workshops allow us to reinforce the social emotional component focusing on building positive social skills, which include friendship, problem solving, self-image, communication, dealing with bullying and teasing, anger management, and much more. Sunshine works together to create partnerships with families, which is extremely important. Each of our programs have a parent support component, which provides daily newsletters, communication, skill building articles, and weekly support groups. During the pandemic, pandemic, we have seen an increase in anxiety and depression and the need for support transitioning back to, from the lack of social interactions back to safe social situations. We have worked hard to incorporate these components into all our programs, teaching and enhancing positive coping skills. We have been doing all we can to support children, parents and guardians during this time. Besides our support and educational groups, we also offer outreach, community service opportunities, holiday assistance, a food pantry, a blessing box, and more services for the community. If you cannot make it to Sunshine, our website has a lot of valuable information and prevention-focused activities for families. While we are a small not-for-profit, we do all we can to make our programs low and affordable for all families to attend. We offer discounted rates, sponsorships, agency support, reduced rates for families in need. Sometimes, since we are only an educational support program and not counseling or therapy, someone may need a higher level of care than Sunshine provides. And we do all that we can to connect that family with other resources in the community, which may be helpful. Registration is currently underway for our summer prevention programs. If you are interested in registration or learning more about Sunshine, I'd like to invite you to meet me or one of my staff and take a tour of the facility. I will also be available to talk in the breakout room later in the conference. We also have flyers in the virtual resource room now. As founder of Sunshine, I was searching for help myself for my own children, which was my motivation in starting Sunshine Prevention Center almost 30 years ago. And this month, Sunshine is celebrating 25 years in our current location in Port Jeff Station. We have gone from reaching 25 participants the first year to reaching several hundred per year in our center-based services. 
Sunshine Prevention Center has become a beacon of light, providing hope and direction for many families, especially those who may be experiencing various struggles and challenges in their lives today. I feel it is so important to know that we are not alone, that others too have gone through the same or similar things. It is my mission when anyone is struggling or faced with challenges that Sunshine can provide the support and direction and offer hope and inspiration to others. If you have questions or need additional information, I will be in the breakout room later. I look forward to meeting or talking with you. Thank you again to the town of Brookhaven for all of their continued support and for this opportunity to share our services with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carter. So now we will move on to our fifth panelist. This is Jennifer Netter and Emily Genus from Gigi's Playhouse. Hello, good evening, friends. I'm just going to have, um, Emily's going to share a screen for me in a minute. I just want to introduce both of us first. My name is Jennifer Netter. My pronouns are she, her. I am the vice president of Gigi's Playhouse Long Island, located in Pacha. I'm also the fundraising committee chair and facilities chair. Um, I am wearing my favorite black Generation G shirt with a white and orange logo. My background is the lovely Brookhaven Inclusion Conference screen. Um, I'm very grateful to be part of this conference so I can collaborate both with the other presenters um, here this evening and give out some really important information about our free purposeful therapeutic programming um, created specifically for individuals with Down syndrome and their families. Um, we are helping bolster these individuals' abilities so that they can be meaningful participants within their communities um, from birth to uh, adulthood. I'm going to allow uh, Emily to now introduce herself. She'll be doing the first part of the presentation. So, Emily. All right. Can everyone see the screen? I hope I've tried sharing it. I hope it's there. But hello, my name is Emily Genus. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the site manager at Gigi's Playhouse Long Island, and I'm currently wearing my favorite Gigi sweatshirt with uh, it's blue with the white Gigi logo on the left side. Um, my background is my orange positivity wall here in my office at Gigi's Playhouse. I'm here to share our wonderful organization, all of our free educational and therapeutic programs we offer here to our Long Island community. So our first slide here is the Gigi's logo on the left-hand side and mine and Jennifer's information, as well as our email and our address. Okay, so the first slide is how it all began. And on the left-hand side is Nancy Gianni, the founder, with her family. So when founder Nancy Gianni gave birth to her daughter, Gigi Gianni, who was diagnosed with Down syndrome, she vowed that she would change the way the world looked at a person with Down syndrome and that she would help people understand that she and all of her friends are so much more than just a diagnosis. Uh, the first location of Gigi's Playhouse opened 2003 in Hoffman Estates, Illinois. Our mission statement is to change the way the world sees down syndrome through national campaigns, educational programs, and by empowering individuals with Down syndrome, their families, and the community. Our purpose is to change the way the world views Down syndrome and to send a global message of acceptance for all. Our how is we change lives through consistent delivery of free educational therapeutic based and career development programs for individuals with Down syndrome, their families, and the community through replicable playhouse model. What is Gigi's Playhouse? So Gigi's Playhouse is the only network of Down Syndrome Achievement Centers. We provide free life-changing therapeutic and educational and career training programs for over 30,000 individuals of all ages. There are 54 brick and mortar locations across the United States and Mexico and over 200 inquiries to start new locations all over the world. We also do a Gigi's online due to COVID-19 where we have reached over 50 plus nations across the world. So who are we? We are a nonprofit organization, an international nonprofit organization. We are 99% volunteer run and we are 100% donation based. There are now 54 Gigi's Playhouse locations across the United States and Mexico and Long Island is the 52nd location. We just opened up this past March 20th, 2021. So we are fairly new. 
And now we're gonna get into Down syndrome 101. So Down syndrome, yes, the lower case is correct, is a genetic disorder whereby a child is born with an extra copy of their 21st chromosome. The cause of Down syndrome is unknown and it does not discriminate across racial or socioeconomic lines. Down syndrome is the leading cause of intellectual development delay in the world, occurring at a rate of one in 691 live births. There are more than 400,000 people living in the United States with Down syndrome. People with Down syndrome can live healthy and fulfilling lives. Recent medical advances as well as cultural and education support for people with Down syndrome and their families provide many opportunities to help overcome challenges. Individuals with Down syndrome are capable and assume they have the potential to succeed. So the four universal challenges of Down syndrome are hypotonia, cognitive impairment, limited adult opportunities, and acceptance. So here at Gigi's Playhouse, we make sure we hit all four of these areas. Our main one, of course, is acceptance and opportunity, career development, education. Everything that we do is based around therapy, free therapeutic and educational programs. And of course, global acceptance. That is one of our main things here. And we have purposeful progression. So the Gigi's Playhouse program lineup provides a purposeful progression in skills and abilities from birth through adulthood. Purposeful progressions measure impact all along the way, not only developmental milestones, which can be very restrictive for Playhouse families. So in this photo here, which is at the bottom, it shows an age progression from a diagnosis, which was prenatal diagnosis to age three, all the way through 18 and older. So Every, each child develops at their own pace, and we encourage the growth, and we encourage this through pur purposeful progression by setting high expectations and encouraging the best of all. So let me make sure everyone can hear me now. Um, so I'm going to run us through the different programs that are offered in the Gigi's program, a typical Gigi's program. Um, like Emily had said, we just opened our doors in um, early March, and we are so excited to be providing um, these services to the Long Island community. Uh, when I first started um, as Gigi's Playhouse, these programs were really some of the most important things. I have a nine-year-old daughter who has Down syndrome, and these things have really benefited her and helped her really interact with her peers um, and family members. So these things are what really, really are the core of, this, of our programs. So LMNOP is one of our first programs. It's called Language, Music, and Our Peeps. And this is typically for the younger uh, preschool age kids. So it can be from birth up until uh, you know, kindergarten area when they're starting to learn their language skills. Um, these programs, this program currently happens once a month right now. Um, then there's a destination discovery program. Oh, language, music, and our peeps. Language, music, and our peeps. So it's from newborn to 36 months. We do offer it to individuals um, up into grade school if they do feel like they could benefit from some of the language development programs that we, we have within the, the curriculum of that program. Um, so this is to help increase language development, focuses on vocabulary. Um, we also have an individual who does uh, sign language during it so that if there are children that are familiar with that, that they can also help um, with the individuals who are engaging in that manner. Um, so, this introduces transitions to the young children, circle time, lots of key, key skills that will help prepare them for their preschool and uh, beyond. Destination discovery. This typically is all age ranges. Um, oftentimes there's, uh, you know, uh, obstacle courses involved. There may be different programs for fine or gross motor. What Destination Discovery does is it supports the development of motor skills, social skills, and language through a purposeful play in a peer-to-peer -peer interaction uh, setting. It's very casual, it's very fun. The kiddos don't even notice that they're um, participating in these different skill drills. They're just enjoying themselves. 
So the goals for these pro the, this destination discovery program is to increase their social skills, uh, focus on a lot of group participation, and then increasing their leisure activity options. So when our kiddo is um, introduced to new different skills or sports, they may be uh, more prone to take those into their uh, leisure activities instead of um, more uh, like gaming and different things like that. So it also increases language development. We focus a lot on vocabulary, on receptive language skills, following directions, answering questions, and promoting a rich and robust uh, interaction with their peers. Um, we also increase their motor skills. Uh, like again, when I said there, they may have a obstacle course or a, an individual may set them to shoot some baskets and then run and maybe do some uh, drills in our playhouse like that. So uh, then they also have some fine motor skills as well that we would develop. Maybe we do some things with tweezer work or we put some puzzles together, uh, lots of different things to, again, gross motor, fine motor activities to help them really bolster their, um, their community development. Another program that we're doing uh, currently, it's called GG Fit. This spans all age ranges. We have it from birth all the way up to adult. Currently our programs we're doing are GG Fit Teen and GG Fit Adult. Um, the recommended ages is 13 and above. So the goals for this, for GG Fit program is to strengthen and tone their muscles, improve balance and coordination, provides a multifaceted approach, which increase sensory, perception, decision-making response times, and it really does maximize their motor control. We also um, utilize this program to teach about healthy meal planning, meal choices, and food science. We have several different one-on-one -on -one signature programs. We have a literacy, a math, and a speech program. Currently, our Patchog Playhouse is providing a we're gonna be providing the literacy program first. Um, this signature program uses, uses research-based methodology with lots of documented success based on um, professionals in the field who have worked with individuals with Down syndrome. So they will train our tutors one-on-one -on -one at the level of that child and then continually challenge and encourage these children um, utilizing manipulatives and various different resources that we have at our playhouse to really create a, a robust love of learning and literacy and reading. So this literacy program builds a strong foundation. Uh, we use whole world, whole world recognition, phonics, vocabulary, comprehension, and improved articulation with our one-on-one -on -one tutoring program. Um, it's recommended for individuals three and up. So anyone can come into the Playhouse and utilize that service um, if they need a little bit of help with reading. Um, the goals for this are to develop uh, the ability to recognize letters, letter combinations, sounds that go together in phonics and phonograms. Um, we also develop the ability to recognize whole words through matching and selecting and naming. We increase text comprehension using leveled reading texts. Right now, we're also utilizing some RAS Kids and some other online interactive programs um, within our tutoring. Um, we increase letter and letter combination recognition, as well as accompanying sounds by teaching phonics with an emphasis again on the phonogram progression. Uh, we also increase the ability to read independently apply the knowledge from reading in a variety of materials and use many writing skills to create projects. So there are some other one-on-one uh, -on -one programs that we do offer eventually at our Patchog uh, Playhouse. We will be introducing the one-on-one -on -one math uh, and a minor grace one-on-one -on -one speech and language program. Both um, of those again are a one-on-one. -on -one, so we will have a tutor and a and a student and it's once a week, those programs for an hour. Um, we will also be doing a kids club, a teentastic and fantastic friends. Those are more for the social emotional development. 
of the individuals with Down syndrome. Um, and they really, there's a very thick research-based oriented um, approach to how individuals are going to help be, uh, you know, more productive in our, in our community. So maybe during a Fantastic Friends, which is an adult program, we would have participants at our playhouse. Maybe we would make a light snack. We would uh, discuss different um, safety methods in a kitchen. Then we would enjoy a meal together and we would um, help them with table manners, help them with cutting if they need cutting of their foods, a lot of practical resources, but yet it's a fun, engaging um, environment. So they don't really, they don't know that they're learning. Um, so, and then there's many, many more programs that a GG's can um, utilize. So there is um, a GG University, which helps with career development. There's also a mugs and hugs program, which is for um, individuals who would work in a setting, help us prepare um, some gift mugs for other individuals and have like light coffee and refreshments there to be served. So there's a lot of opportunities for a Gigi's Playhouse. Um, and we're really, really excited to, uh, to be in Patchog. This is our calendar of events that's current for June. So we have the destination discovery um, happening a few times. This is actually on our virtual table. So we also have a couple really big events coming up that we're really excited about. On June 5th is our Gigi's Fit Acceptance Challenge. And it's, it's a movement challenge to help individuals build awareness for Down syndrome and, our, um, and the individuals. And we also have our third annual Gigi's Playhouse Golf Outing, which is gonna be on G June 24th. So here's the two save the dates, one for the golf outing and then for the GG Fit Acceptance Challenge. Um, anyone, again, anyone is, is available to come to our playhouse as long as you feel that it's gonna benefit you. So you don't necessarily have to have Down syndrome if you feel the program is gonna be beneficial to you, then come on in and we, we, we open our arms to you. Um, you know, for me personally, Gigi's Playhouse has been, you know, a, a refreshing place where individuals can go and feel encouraged that, um, you know, that there's there's a place where they can be accepted and loved for who they are. Um, so it's exciting. So thank you guys all very much. I really appreciate your time. Um, visit our virtual the virtual table and. We'll see you at the playhouse. Thank you. You're welcome. Also, um, before we just quickly go off, for the GG Fit Acceptance Challenge, it is here at our playhouse from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And it's open to the community. So it's a whole community event. So if you want to bring your kiddos, please do. It's going to be so much fun. We're going to have so many activities. We're having like over 10 obstacle courses. We're having refreshments, food. It'll be a blast. So please definitely come on down. Our registration is on our website. If you go to our website and hit events, it'll be right there up top and it'll drop down and hit GG Fit Acceptance Challenge and you'll be able to register there and everything. So thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. GG's Playhouse sounds incredible. Um, and congrats on the new opening. That is such a success on your end. Um, so we're gonna move on now to the next panelist, Roberta Rosenberg from Destination Accessible. Unmute. Did it work? It says my browser does not, will not allow me to do this. You're good, Roberta. We can see and hear you. You can hear me. Okay. Yes. Okay. Because my screen is now blank. So I can't see anything. But okay, I'll go on. You can see me. So that's fine. Yep. So hi, all. I'm Roberta Rosenberg. Uh, I use the pronouns she and her. 
I am the founder of Destination Accessible, which is a nonprofit dedicated to enriching the lives of people with mobility challenges, including someone who might be a slow or unsteady walker, uh, someone needing to rest often, someone using a cane, walker, wheelchair, or even someone in a carriage. Uh, my background is my bedroom because my husband commandeered my office for a meeting that he had. My hope is that you will be interested enough in what I have to say that you will visit our website. At the moment, the best I can do is a picture of our logo. I hope you can see that um, and remember it when you go online. I'm wearing a light blue sweater and a necklace that was made from my mom's engagement ring. And when I wear it, I feel very close to her, even though she is gone for many years. I will be sharing with you how Destination Accessible strives to help everyone be included when they go out for some fun. And I know our name sounds like a, um, a travel agency, but we are not. The dictionary defines inclusion as the action of including or being included within a group. I think of inclusion as being part of a group. Destination Accessible believes everyone should have the opportunity to be included at all times with all things. We want everyone to have the best experience possible when they're going out to a restaurant, a park, a theater, a museum, a kid-friendly place, any other kind of popular venue. We believe that everyone deserves to have a good time, including those with mobility challenges. Venues should be equipped to include everyone, but the sad truth is many of them are not. If they are not, they should at least let you know what they do and do not have. Going to a venue's website or using a site like Yelp or TripAdvisor or even calling the venue often does not provide adequate or correct information. They may tell you that the main entrance is wheelchair accessible. But what happens when you get inside? Do they tell you about steps, ramps, elevators? Do they tell you about seating or ease of navigation? Do they tell you what type of restrooms there are? Do they tell you about the accessible stall in a restaurant? Do they tell you the size of it? Do they tell you if there is a single occupancy accessible restroom or its size? I recently had the experience of calling a venue and being told that the restroom was wheelchair accessible only to arrive and find out that the hallway to the restroom was barely wide enough for our wheelchair. And the restroom itself was too narrow for a wheelchair and perhaps even a walker. Yes, there were handrails in the restroom and so they consider that accessible. But nothing else in that room would allow a person with a handicap to use it. And my husband was the person trying to use that restroom while he was in a wheelchair, it wasn't happening. Because of this lack of information, Destination Accessible was born. If venues themselves were not going to provide this information, we decided that we would. Destination Accessible provides free, firsthand, detailed accessibility information of the kinds of places I just mentioned, restaurants, parks, theaters, places people go for fun. We offer information on grounds, parking, entrances, steps, ramps, elevators, ease of navigation, flooring, seating, restrooms, anything pertinent to someone with a mobility challenge. Our website is very easy to navigate. You can search for a specific venue, and if it is among the more than 500 we have on our site so far, you will find an entry for it. You can also look at our categories or geographic locations to find new interesting places to visit. When you find a venue you wanna know more about, click it on, click on it and it will take you to that page. Once on the page, you will find a brief description of the venue. You will find our checklist, including the things I told you about and our read more. Our read more is kind of, I would call it our personal blog of the venue on the date we visited. Our Read More gives you not only the information, but it will give you a flavor for the venue. That's right, you heard it correctly. We personally visit each of the venues on our site. And because we have visited every venue, you can be assured that the information you find is correct as of the date of our last visit. 
Most of our venues are on Long Island and the New York metro area. We have some entries for venues in other locations, and those are based on places we have visited. We have a mini section on San Francisco because my only grandchild lives there. We encourage you to please visit our website and see what we offer. I would like to offer one more suggestion to you. If you are calling a venue, because we, we only have 500 on the website, I'm sure there are plenty of places you might want to call. I cannot stress strongly enough that you need to be very specific in asking about what you want to know. If you're asking about accessibility, know that many people do not even know what that term means. People who do not need these accommodations often don't have any idea about them. If you don't need it, you probably don't notice it. If you want to know about steps, you should ask, how many steps are there at the main entrance? If you know that that number is too much, whether it's because of a wheelchair or because of walking or any other issue, ask if there is an accessible entrance. Ask if there is another entrance to get in. Ask where it is, where it goes once you get inside. One young lady I spoke with on the phone some time ago told me that there were too many steps at the main entrance for us to use with our wheelchair. But she said, we would have no difficulty using the wheelchair at the back entrance because there were only three steps there. If you wanna know, excuse me, if you wanna know about restrooms, you need to be direct. Are there any accessible restrooms? You might have to explain what accessible means. You might need to explain and ask if they are large enough to accommodate a wheelchair, if you need that. If you need a single occupancy restroom, you need to ask specifically about that. When the person on the phone gives you an answer, it would be really wise to ask that person if they have personally seen what they are telling you. For each thing you ask about, it's important to check that the person answering you has in fact seen that accommodation. If she has not personally seen it, you might want to ask to speak to someone who has more knowledge or ask the person to check and call you back. On several occasions, I have encountered people who were honest enough at the outset to say they didn't know, but they would check. And each time the person in fact did call back. Those are just some of the suggestions we have for you. Thank you for this opportunity to give you some suggestions about having the best experience possible when you wanna go for some fun. Being able to do this levels the playing field and allows everyone to have an inclusive experience. Everyone deserves to have the best experience possible. Destination Accessible helps you to do that by allowing you to know before you go. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Ms. Rosenberg. So at this time, we're going to keep moving along to Daria Gentile from Emix Elder Care. Hi, everybody. I'm Daria. Good evening. Thanks so much, Nicole. Appreciate it. So um, again, my name is Daria Gentile. My pronouns are she and her. I'm pleased to be here and I am the relationship manager for MX Elder Care. I am currently wearing a gray jacket and I do have brown hair. It is tied up in a bun. I'm also wearing my favorite reading glasses if you can see them and they are my favorite. They are black rimmed, but I don't know if you can see the tiny little rhinestones on the sides. And I love that because I love Lang. Anyway, um, it's really my pleasure to meet you all. And I'm really fortunate to be a resident almost 30 years with the town of Brookhaven and a proud mama of three children who went through Middle Country. And it's just great to be here and hear the resources that uh, are joining us tonight. So I'm really excited to be a part of, uh, of, of, of working with all of you. I want to extend a big thank you to Cliff to Nicole for working with us and the town of Brookhaven for including us tonight and allowing us to share what we do at MX Elder Care. So I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, hang on one second. And hopefully it's gonna work. Let's see. 
You guys tell me if I have a thumbs up, it's coming through. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little slow. Can you see that? Okay, terrific. It's still loading. Um, all right, I'm just gonna let it go with the way it is instead of full screen, if that's okay, Nicole. Looks okay, can you see it? Yes, thumbs up? It is all good, you're ready to rock. Okay, cool, sorry about that. All good. So back to um, an introduction for MX Elder Care. We are Medicaid specialists. We provide Medicaid planning and advocacy. We represent and specialize in the programs for long-term care under Medicaid. Our mission is to spread awareness through education, support, and guidance, and to help families understand how Medicaid for long-term care can assist in providing care at home or in a skilled nursing environment through the various programs available. We are passionate about helping families connect their loved ones to the very best care by obtaining more beneficial and predictable outcomes in care. We accomplish this by our expertise and advocacy in navigating through what is otherwise an extremely complex and challenging process. We serve all of the New York City boroughs as well as both Nassau and Suffolk counties on Long Island. For tonight's time period with MX Elder Care, I would like to share a little bit more about one of the specific programs we represent within Medicaid, and it's the NHTD waiver program. And NHTD is Nursing Home Transition and Diversion Waiver Program. Let's talk about how this program helps with inclusion into the community. The Nursing Home Transition and Diversion Medicaid Waiver is a home and community-based services program that uses Medicaid funding to provide support and services to assist individuals with disabilities and seniors towards successful inclusion in the community. Waiver participants may come from a nursing facility or other institution, thereby transitioning, or choose to participate in the waiver program to prevent institutionalization, which is otherwise diversion. The NHTD is appropriate when informal supports, local, state, and federally funded services and Medicaid state plan services are not sufficient to assure the health and welfare of the client in the community or when the NHTD services are more efficient use of Medicaid funds. Let's take a look at the eligibility criteria. So an individual applying to participate in the waiver must meet all of the following criteria in order to be approved for the NHTD program. First, they have to be a recipient of Medicaid coverage that supports community-based long-term care services. Second, be between the age of 18 and 64 with a physical disability or age 65 or older upon application to the waiver. Three, be assessed to need a nursing home level of care. Nursing home eligibility is determined by the patient review instrument, which is PRI, and a screening. Fourth, sign the freedom of choice form indicated that he or she chooses to participate in the NHTD waiver. Five, be able to identify the actual location and living arrangements in which the client participant will be living when participating in the waiver. Eligibility criteria continued. Six, 
complete and submit an application packet, which includes the initial service in cooperation with the service coordinator. Seven, have a complete plan for protective oversight, known as a PPO, be capable of directing his or her own service plan or has a legal guardian available to direct the client's service plan. Number eight, services agreed upon in the initial service plan or ISP must meet regional and statewide cost neutrality and nine, be able to live in the community where the health and welfare of that client can be maintained. Let's talk about, uh, dive into a couple of the benefits of this program. One being service coordination. The service coordinator assists the prospective client to become a waiver client and coordinates and monitors the provision of all services in the service plan. Services may include Medicaid state plan services, non-Medicaid federal, state, and locally funded services, as well as educational, vocational, social, and medical services. The service coordinator's goal is to increase the client's independence, productivity, and integration into the community while maintaining the health and welfare of the individual. Let's talk for a moment about environmental modifications, specifically to assist with vehicles and assistive technology. Vehicle modifications provide the client with the means to access services and supports in the community, increase independence, and promote productivity. These modifications may include adaptive equipment and or vehicle modifications. With assistive technology services, that supplements the state plan Medicaid service for durable medical equipment and supplies. And that provides a broad range of special medical equipment as well as supplies. This service will be approved when the requested equi equipment and supplies directly contribute to the client's level of independence, ability to access needed supports and services in the community or maintain or improve the client's safety. Assistive technology is limited in most cases to $35,000 per a 24 month period. Environmental modification service is another component of this waiver. Under environmental modifications or EMODs as they're called, internal and external physical adaptations to the home, which are necessary to ensure the health and welfare and safety of the, of the individual are allowed. These modifications enable a client to function with greater independence and prevent institutionalization. EMODs, including as we spoke about vehicle modifications as well, have a limit up to 45,000 per 36 month period. EMODs do not include improvements to the home such as carpeting, roof repair, central air conditioning, which are not medically necessary or do not promote the client's independence in the home or community. And just to wrap up, those are a few of the benefits of that waiver program. Of course, there's so much information additionally that we can share with you regarding Medicaid for long-term care programs. And this slide has our contact information. Um, Guido and I are both here and we hope that you will join us in the breakout room after this. We'd be happy to share any additional information and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you, Ms. Gentile, that was fantastic. And with that, we will move on to our final panelist. That's Nick Farr from Music Academy for Special Learners. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Very excited. Get a screen share going over here. Wonderful. 
Great. So I'm I'm here to talk to you about the Music Academy for Special Learners Occlusion, Inclusion via Creative Arts. So the Music Academy... Oh, I forgot to do my whole introduction. I'm so sorry. I, I, I got so excited to talk to you about all of these things. I skipped. I skipped it. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back. I can follow instructions. Well, my name is Nick. Uh, he, him pronouns. I am the, the director of music therapy at the Music Academy for Special Learners. Um, <laughs> my, my background here, uh, beyond my microphone, I have an electric piano here with some few things that uh, music art that I've not hung up yet because I just moved in. Uh, so I'll get there. Wearing a nice, comfortable cardigan uh, because that's what therapists do, right? Wear sweaters and cardigans. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the Music Academy my slideshow here. Okay, so the Music Academy for Special uh, Learners was founded in 2007. We are a music and art center. We provide a variety of different services, including music therapy, music lessons, adaptive music lessons, groups of all of these different varieties, and also uh, art lessons. I haven't added on there, but we also have art therapists here on our staff now. I'm very excited. And we, um, our general philosophy, regardless of service, is that Everyone is a special learner, and we want to make sure each person that comes to us, regardless of service, gets a customized experience uh, to fit, not only to bolster their strengths, but to provide reinforcement and the support they need uh, in, in all areas. So regardless of service that we're working with, there's that customized care to them. I think the adaptive um, music lessons and music instruction is re and for art is a little more self-explanatory. So I wanted to take a moment to talk about um, music therapy and its role in inclusion with the people that we serve. So first, that may be uh, interesting to start out with, what is music therapy? I'm going to give you a very generalized uh, definition, which is the evidence-based use of music interventions to address clinical goals by a credentialed professional. That is very vague because we work with uh, people across the lifespan in a variety of different populations and settings, so it's hard to narrow that down from there. But let's talk about where music therapists may come from. Uh, they all have a degree in music therapy. They have a clinical internship that is over 1,040 hours uh, under supervision of, of others, a, board, a national board certification. Uh, in, in New York, there, there's a bill for our own license to go up, but the rest of us fit under what's called the LCAT, the Licensed Creative Arts Therapist. And there are specialty certifications, which at our site, uh, at the Music Academy, we have three... Uh, of our music therapists that have post-master specialty certifications. So our approach in general uh, begins with, like all other types of therapists, with uh, the same type of process. We begin with a referral that we're given, an assessment, we develop treatment plans, uh, we provide treatment and documentation and evaluation. What makes us different than, than some other uh, clinics that you may visit or music therapists that you may interact with is that we follow what's called music-centered thinking, which is that the individualized music experience that people participate in is what is most essential to us. It is to utilize the strengths to begin the process of making music as soon as we enter the room, regardless of what is in there, and that it is something that uh, is a successful experience for them. And it's, of course, it's research-based. Music therapy has been uh, a profession here in the United States for getting close to 100 years. We're not new. We've been around. And we have bodies of research going uh, back for, for decades. I'm going as fast as I can. Uh, one, of the, one of the areas that I really wanted to highlight that we specialize in is what's called clinical provincialization, where we start by following the lead of the person that's in the room. This can be uh, whether they walk up to an instrument and start uh, playing, whether the way that they move when they're sitting in a chair, their affect, all of that begins with us coming to where they are to meet them in their current state, and then trying to enter a way of two-way communication in the way that we play. I play something, you play something, we l we're listening to each other and interacting with the goal of shifting into what was called interrelated uh, music making, where we are, uh, the goal is that we sound like partners. We sound like teammates making this music together. There's not as much of the power structure. We're not listening always in this receptive thing. We're equal partners 
to, to provide agency for, for the people that we serve. And so I wanted to give, uh, I won't let this video play the whole time, but a little short example of what this can look like. Um, a, a, a colleague music therapist working with, with a teenager who they're working to develop um, not only the functional use of his voice, but for the confidence to use it, the flexibility. You'll, so you'll see through how they play and interact that they're listening to each other, they're responding in this improvisation. It continues. Uh, I, I, I'd love to show more, but I want to make sure we get get time for everything. Um, I also wanted to say that autoplay um, that especially in in response to the 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 COVID epidemic, the rise of telehealth and telehealth music therapy has also been uh, a wide success, which is something we we've continued to provide throughout the year, and we will not stop providing it even as things start to return to in person. So I wanted to give a little sample of what this can be like uh, through it's it's me uh, working with a a teenage young lady, and we're also just coincidentally, working on uh, our voices, but through challenging each other and who can do something more. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Oh, you can't. Yes, I can. I can sing anything slower than No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Oh, it, it just wants to do it again. It wants to sh show it again. Okay, so uh, an example of what clinical goals can be, we really focus in the Music Academy on the, the capacity to build and expand relationships. And to do that requires a lot of different skills, attention, adaption to the people we're working with, a range of responses in our flexibility, engagement, and motivation is key. We must be motivated to socially interact with people, not for an external reward, but because it makes us feel something. And um, also, I, I just thought I'd throw in IEP support as well through different processes. Um, so, and I know there's going to be questions later. I think I got it in 10 minutes. We're good. I'll, I'll be around to answer any questions in the, in the breakout rooms. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Okay, Molly. 
Thank you, Nick. That was awesome. That was really cool. We always like music. Everybody, thank you so much to the panelists for taking the time tonight to be here um, and for sharing valuable information with our community. The task uh, Disability Task Force mission is not um, just about our partners, what they can do for us, but it's about what we can do for them to disseminate these valuable resources to our community. Uh, Cliff always likes to talk about the three C's. I am a firm believer of the three C's. Coordinate, <laughs> collaborate, and communicate. I actually stole that from my son. <laughs> Again, I would like to remind everyone to please visit our virtual resource tables on the web, our website and to view resources from our panelists and other partners of the task force. Our virtual resource table site will close one hour after the event. If you are unable to see the resource tables during the event, please do not hesitate to email Cliff and he will make sure to provide you with the information. At this time, we will move to our 15-minute breakout room sessions for Q&A dialogue with the panelists of your choosing. Please insert the name of the organization for which room you would like to be admitted to in the box and allow a few minutes for the host to admit you to the room. So while we are deciding our breakout rooms, I would like to uh, just go ahead and still continue to Michael. He had a closing remark. If you're there, Michael. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, a lot of you have already probably uh, left, but this is being recorded. Um, so uh, hello, everyone. My name is Michael Iasilli. My pronouns are he, him and I am a member of the Brookhaven Disability Task Force. And uh, first, I, I wanna thank Marlene Patty and Cliff Heimowitz, who should be an inspiration to us all for their committed advocacy. Um, I couldn't think of a better team to lead our task force. And I also wanna thank the town board for appointing me and welcoming, wel welcoming me here. Uh, it's because of your interest in helping those who are sometimes forgotten that we are able to ha have events like this and speak about inclusion. Not to mention the Department of Housing and Community Development has done so much to go above and beyond to get this conference up and running. So I'm gonna be talking about how I envision our public system to advocate and advance the interests of those with special needs. And I'll start with um, the fact that my sister grew up with a cognitive learning disability that hinders her ability to process information. Um, and being on the spectrum hasn't been easy for her. Uh, she was placed in special ed classes, she was bullied, and struggled in her education, and those things certainly affected her emotionally. But she is strong, and there were a few things she was really interested in, and still is, by the way, like her love of animals. She grew fascinated with the spectacle of Hollywood and spent nights reading over trivial pursuit cards. You might not think so initially, but these activities, these interests, were a central part of her development. And so, so my family tried to help her to learn by using categories that interested her. And Nicole became a whiz on Jeopardy and would surprise everyone with her answers on Wheel of Fortune, even when there were no letters on the puzzle yet. However, Nicole, Nicole still struggled socially. It was still difficult to balance her checkbook, understand the function of punctuation, money, and being independent. Worse, she was even taken advantage of by a stranger who posed as a friend who knew they could get one over on her. My parents were scared. And so for 10 years, my parents went through an arduous expedition to find out how to secure my sister's future, attempting to figure out what services can put their concerns at ease. Like many parents, you're never too old to care for your children. My parents love my sister. I love my sister. So as I got older, I became more involved, helping my parents to contact lawmakers to help us through what is to so many a daunting and complex jungle. In fact, my father spent many sleepless nights attempting to find out how we can have some peace of mind when it came to my sister's future. It wasn't until we got put into contact with Cliff Heimowitz did my parents finally have direction on where to go. We came across a wide variety of opportunities and services, both in the private sector, nonprofits, and services um, uh, that are delivered by the state. Um, it's not just my, my parents, though. Many folks in our community have questions on how to help their children with special needs. Even special needs individuals themselves have questions about where to go. We should seek to have a more robust apparatus in government to help members in our community navigate the complexity of resources because finding them is not easy. And in 2021, we should work to make it easier. Being able to find services and obtain them 
uh, fall, also falls in line with the theme of our conference this evening, inclusion. We should be doing everything we can to make sure we are listening, responding, and providing assistance where it is needed. And this task force is showing exactly why such an effort in this direction is valuable. To take it a step forward, we need to begin talking about how we strengthen transitional programs in our public schools. We should be focusing on finding ways to work closer together with our school districts, creating a town and school district partnership to assist parents and students in the special needs community so that their hope of achieving the American dream is brighter and less precarious. And finally, I think we should seek a broader advocacy of special needs that intersects with the LGBTQ plus community and other minority groups that often get overlooked. We touch on all of these areas in this evening's event, as we have heard. But tonight's theme cannot be overstated. Everyone deserves to be heard. Everyone should be listened to. Your struggle is my struggle. This is why tonight's discussion is so important. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm so glad that I was able to share my thoughts. Have a great evening, everybody. <laughs> Hello, welcome back everybody. Um, we hope that you want to stick around because a big part of what we want to do tonight was we wanted to hear from the community. So I want to reintroduce um, Winnie Schiff who will be monitoring our discussion on inclusion. So for those of you interested in sticking around, please do. We really want to hear what you have to say. So Winnie, it's all yours. Okay, hi everybody. So we got so much great information tonight. I loved hearing about all the services that are available. And um, I also loved hearing about how much advocacy is kind of behind what um, a lot of you do. So let's just open it up to anybody who's still with us who would like to talk about what advocacy means to you. Um, you could also feel free to ask questions or just make comments. So um, do, do people have to raise their hand to be unmuted or can they just unmute themselves? They can unmute themselves. So if anybody would like to speak, uh, you have the ability to unmute your microphone. If you need any help, just raise your hand and we can prompt you to unmute. So I'd like to speak. I, I would just like to say thank you. This was incredible. And I, it, it, it warms my soul to see all the good things that people do and how much there is out there for, 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 for getting people to be included in all varieties and in all ways. And I just think it's wonderful. And I, I look forward to finding out more about some of these organizations because I love it. Me too. Thanks, Roberta. Anybody else? Am I muted? Am I unmuted? You're good. When my um, my son was in his accident back in 2011, and I wish something like this was around back then because I mean, we felt alone. We felt like you know nobody else was walking in our shoes. Nobody else knew the hardships that we were going through, and and uh, resources were very limited. I cannot. I am so blessed. And watching some of these videos brought tears to my eyes because there is so much out there for so many people that it, it's just a wonderful thing. Everything that you guys put together. It, it just, it blessed me to even be a part of this and, and um, you know, to just to share what, what's out there and, and um, people aren't alone and th there are resources and, and I, I was just blown away by top soccer and the music. I, I had to fight back the tears of joy, you know, it was just, it was, it was so cool. It was so cool to watch. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, I think anybody who has struggled feeling like there are no services available for me and I don't know where to turn, including me with my own children, are so grateful when somebody is willing to you know, meet you where you are and provide what you need in order to take the next step. Because we're always hopeful, but sometimes it's pretty lonely when we're waiting for the next person who can help us. So I, I agree 100%. Somebody else? Uh, 
I just unmuted. Oh, Tara. Um, <laughs> hi. And I wanted to say thank you for your kind words because, you know, I brought my girls to your farm and all the amazing things that you're doing for the community over there. I mean, having a wheelchair accessible garden is a beautiful thing because that's not generally an activity that would be offered to that population. So thank you for all that you're doing. And I'm very excited for your sensory garden too. So, thank you. Okay, um, I guess anybody else want to speak? I want to speak. Wait. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, so again, uh, what are the that everyone else had spoke about Anne and Roberta and Tara and um, just that this is a wonderful collaboration and I appreciate you putting this together because, you know, like they all said in the beginning, you feel like there's no one there to help you. And knowing that all these great individuals are out there putting together all of these programs and these advocacies to help others, it's just, it's, a, it's definitely a blessing. So um, I appreciate all of you. And, and a lot of those, it's, it's funny when um, Emily and I were watching some of the videos for TOPS and there was a bunch of our kiddos there who are board members' children. And it's just nice to see that, you know, um, there's that reciprocal movement of all of these individuals doing, sharing all of these experiences with, with all of us. And it's, it's just beautiful. So thank you. I have more. <laughs> Sorry. Marco, you're good. You're good. For Gigi's Playhouse, to kind of piggyback off that too. Um, I had mentioned in my presentation that I'm a physical therapist and I work with special needs kids. And your facility is so great for these guys because I have so many that aren't really qualifying for like a school-based need, but they still need to do things and get stronger and work their muscles. And having a facility like yours is perfect. So thank you for all you're doing over there. Well, you're welcome. We feel blessed to be able to do it. I just want to tell you that as the newest family member, we really welcome Gigi's Playhouse. And we look forward to doing whatever we can do to support you and encourage people to take advantage of your activities. And we look forward to future involvement with all of you because we are a family and we're a community and we're only strong as we work together. So I really can't thank everybody enough. I really want to thank Public Information. Um, we wrote about it in our agenda and a thank you, but without the staff um, of um, Michelle and Matt and Jack, and Karen, we wouldn't have, this would never have happened. And so we're grateful that you guys took an interest in what we wanted to do. And thank you so much. And I want to make a special thank you to Lucia, my boss, Lucia Alam. <laughs> if it wasn't for Lucia, I'm not sure this would even come off. I mean, she's such a supportive person. She's, a, she's an amazing friend. She's an amazing coworker. And she's just an amazing person. And I don't think she's watching, but if you are, I just want to let you know that we really appreciate you. And also, I have to thank Marlene. I mean, Marlene and I go back so far. And you don't remember. Really, I don't remember. <laughs> but, but the thing is that we, if it wasn't for Marlene, we never would have evolved to the task force we are now. And so um, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I want to add to that. So when my son was diagnosed, um, he's seven. He was diagnosed at two. And I really had no idea what to do. Like there wasn't, I really was so new to me. I didn't even talk to kids before. So um, I was fortunate enough on a rainy night to take a drive to Longwood School District for their SEPTA just to get out there and figure out what am I gonna do. And I met Cliff and he was like the most resourceful person there who was not getting the information he needed, which was data to show the town that this is something that's necessary and that we need to help our constituents and that, you know, there's a lot that we can still do and there's going to be a lot that we can do. Um, so it was just really awesome. And it's really awesome that Cliff can understand the struggles of a person with a disability and he can articulate them and get groups together. And obviously we have to thank everyone that was already mentioned and especially the students, the OT students, um, and the student for the logo at Suffolk Community College in Riverhead Campus. Um, this logo behind us right here was created by the student in the class. We actually have a logo from our, our prior event as well. Um, and it honestly really takes a team and a community and a village. So we want to encourage you guys to also uh, reach out to your council people, let them know if this was valuable, that you enjoyed it, that this is good, and that 
thank them for allowing us to do this and giving us the resources so we can continue to do more. So I guess we'll wrap it up. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>